your daily Miami Dolphins podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Dolphins fans, and welcome to another episode of Locked On Dolphins. I'm your host, Kyle Krabs, managing editor of USA Today's Dolphins Wire, director of scouting the draftnetwork.com, lifelong Miami Dolphins fan, and back on the horse here on the live stream, interacting with some of you guys on the YouTube channel. I'll make sure you check it out if you're interested. Locked On Dolphins, like this video, subscribe to the channel. That way you get push notifications when we do some of these impromptu uh, live recordings of episodes of Locked On Dolphins. And today on the show, we're shifting our eyes forward. We're, week two is in the past. It's water under the bridge, right? So we're, we're going to be looking at what it is about the matchup with a 2-0 and Raiders team in Las Vegas that are dynamics that I like about this matchup. Obviously, we need to figure out who's playing quarterback for the Dolphins, and that's... Uh, not something we'll probably have clarity on until the middle of the week, but uh, to a tongue of a low, it's been reported on, on a number of instances. Uh, his availability is going to come down to pain management, probably wear a flak jacket, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there's some layers to this Raiders team that I think are really interesting. And I, I do think it puts a strength on strength opportunity into the Dolphins hands. And I, I think that's uh, exciting to, to dig into a little bit. But before we get to the Raiders, we do need to talk about some of the reported changes, uh, courtesy of Barry Jackson and the Miami Herald, uh, that may be coming down the chute this weekend uh, for the Miami Dolphins offensive line, which was abysmal, woeful, horrible, tragic, whatever adjective you want to use to describe the Dolphins offensive line. And if it's a negative one, it's probably going to fit. Uh, so the reported news, according to, to Barry Jackson, the Miami Herald, is that Solomon Kinley is the first guy on the block to get pushed to the bench. And uh, that, that appears to be the case. Uh, the reported move is Liam Eikenberg moving into the lineup to play at guard in place of Solomon Kinley, which I think is is really interesting because, from my opinion, Solomon Kinley is the least of your worries on the offensive line. Um, I don't know how you watch these offensive tackles play football and say Solomon Kinley at left guard's the problem. Um, I would love to see Liam Eikenberg play his natural position at left tackle. And if it were me, that's the move that I would start with, is I would put probably Liam at left tackle – you want to experiment with Austin Jackson at guard, which is something that reportedly has been kicked around in the building. That's fine. Do that. But he can't keep playing tackle. He just, it, you go watch the, the play that was there at that position. And I don't know how you justify leaving him in other than probably the understanding that this is, uh, this is something you don't really come back from without a lot of uh, overcoming adversity, right? And to be fair, well, not to be fair, but uh, let's be fair to A.J. Epinesa on the other side for Buffalo. Uh, he's owned Austin Jackson going back to when they played, and I think it was the Holiday Bowl when USC played Iowa. So that's a guy who has historically just ate Austin's lunch, uh, and he did it again on Sunday. So uh, somebody who's, who's in the comments here saying I go too easy on Coach Flo. Jason, Kyle, I love your stuff and think you're – uh, very knowledgeable about, about football, but you tend to go soft on Flores and Greer. I'm glad you mentioned that, Jason, because um, I try my best to put things in perspective as best as I can without being overly reactionary and emotional with, with things that are happening. And it's, my process is very much rooted in why is it the Dolphins are operating the way that they are. But we have enough of a sample size now between the preseason and week two and his rookie season, and what I thought of Austin Jackson before the season, that like this is one of those things that like I've had enough. So uh, I don't agree with the idea that Solomon Kinley is the guy that needs to go to the bench. That's what they're going to try to do. We'll see how it goes. Uh, at least it's a change. 
because I think the worst thing you could do is keep everything status quo and hope that everybody's just going to wake up and decide to, to come play harder against the Raiders than they did against the Bills. So uh, it, it's not what it would look like for me. I would probably move Robert Hunt back out to right tackle too. Um, so for me, it would probably be Eichenberg at left tackle. Uh, you want to keep Eichen or you want to keep Kinley at left guard, or if you alternatively want to move him back to right guard and put Jesse Davis or Robert Jones or or somebody in there at left guard and then keep Dieter at center and then Kinley at the other guard spot and then Robert Hunt at right tackle, that's probably what it would look like for me if I were being honest on how I would approach reshuffling the offensive line. I don't think we're going to get that dramatic of a response from Miami. But it might not hurt to just kind of go a completely different direction with how bad things were um, against Buffalo. But this is a good segue for us to kind of get into what the Raiders do really well, um, which is they have two really, really, really good pass rushers in Yannick Ngakwe and... Uh, Max Crosby. Crosby has 19 pressures, two, uh, eight quarterback hits, an additional nine carry uh, hurries through the first two games of the season. But here's what I'm really interested in as far as how the Raiders match up against Miami versus what Buffalo did in their game. They don't blitz. They're like one of the least frequent blitz teams through the first two games of the season. Pro Football Reference has them tracked with four blitzes, uh, Jonathan Abram blitzing one, uh, blitz opportunity, Nate Hobbs, uh, two blitz opportunities and KJ Wright, one blitz opportunity. Uh, so they, they do really have not blitzed throughout the first two games of the season with any level of frequency, which means they're relying on this organic pass rush from Crosby and Ngakwe, which is not what the bills did. So now, either the Raiders are going to see what the Bills put on tape against Miami and going to say, we're going to try and replicate that, even though that really isn't who we are. And then you run the risk of, okay, you know, are you going to have the success doing that that Buffalo did? When Buffalo, I think, is a much more impressive defense from top to bottom anyway. Or are you going to say, we're going to use our model to win and not try to replicate what Buffalo had so much success with and give Miami more avenues to help their tackles in protection, right? So that, for me, is the big storyline in this game, is is the Raiders going to abandon the model that they have used to win through the first two weeks of the season to pursue what the Bills did? Or, alternatively, are the Raiders going to stay true to their guns and their identity and say, Crosby and Ngakwe by themselves, those two guys can bring the rain. We're going to attack these guys off the edge. Because I don't think this is a defensive depth chart, to be completely honest with you, that's going to get a lot of push up inside. So that's the first bullet point that I have as I'm looking at this Raiders game, asking myself, where does it get better? Well, regardless of what changes they're making, I don't think the Raiders are going to be able to execute the Buffalo Bills game plan from week two with anywhere near the level of success based on their depth chart that the Bills did. I also think there's a pretty good chance they're just going to rely on Crosby and Ngakwe to bring a lot of pressure by themselves and rely on organic pressure. Can Miami block those two guys up? At least if they're just bringing guys off the edge, you can step up into the pocket. And at least if they're just bringing guys off the edge, you can throw help with extra tight ends in the backs and chip instead of we're watching Miles Gaskin kind of preempt his play fake in in either play action or RPO or, or whatever we our play calls are and try and take on a linebacker in the B-gap and get completely blown up. So as I'm looking at this Raiders game, that's definitely the top of my list for why I think offensively you got a much better chance for success and setting a season high in points scored, which I know is a low bar. They scored 17 against New England. They didn't score at all against Buffalo. But uh, I do think this is a favorable matchup for Miami's offense to get back on the horse and leave all that BS behind him in week two.
We're back and better than ever. All eyes on the gridiron as teams are back to start yet another football season. As always, Bet Online is your number one spot for all the pro and college action this season. With an updated site and interface with even more odds, props, and contests, BetOnline.ag continues to be the number one source for everything football. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today to receive a 100% welcome bonus that's double your initial deposit just for signing up. Don't forget to use the promo code NFL100 from football, basketball, boxing, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Do not wait to take advantage of the amazing offers available for the start of the 2021 season. Bet online, your online sportsbook experts. Dolphins fans, listen up. I got an incredible app for everyone who buys gas. Get upside. My listeners are making up to 25 cents per gallon every time they fill up at the, at the pump. Just download the free GetUpside app in the App Store or Google Play right now and use promo code TOUCHDOWN and get a 25 cent bonus per gallon on your first fill up. That's up to 50 cents cash pack per gallon. Don't pay full price at the pump anymore. Get cash back using Get Upside. Just download the app for free and use promo code TOUCHDOWN to get up to 50 cents per gallon cash back on your first tank. That's promo code TOUCHDOWN with Get Upside. Question from Jonathan. Why didn't Jalen Phillips get any reps? Uh, Jalen Phillips has played 40 snaps defensively for the Dolphins. This is off the top of my head. So if these numbers are not 100% accurate, please forgive me. Uh, he's played 39, 40 reps defensively uh, for the Dolphins. And of those 40 reps, uh, he's been given 24 pass rush opportunities and generated two pressures and 24 pass rush opportunities. Uh, so his pass rush productivity rate is about in line of what I think it was better than Emmanuel Agba's was last year across two games, which is not dissimilar to what it was in the preseason. Miami's coaching staff, and, and I think this is something that we all probably shame on us a little bit for getting a little wrapped up in. Uh, this Dolphins coaching staff is still very much absolutely keeping a long-term view with the team, much more so than we are because we were ready to buy in as the Dolphins as a legitimate contender uh, coming off a 10-win season and, and addressing a number of needs on the roster. Uh, they are still very much rooted in player development, and Jalen, uh, I think they're being very deliberate with his, his opportunities and when he's getting into the game instead of just being a plug-and-play starter, which I understand his role on a week-to-week -week basis is going to be predicated on matchups and size and power at the point of attack and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Jalen's played 40 snaps in two games, which is about 35% of the Dolphins' defensive snaps, if my memory serves me correctly, and I'm not a math guy, so especially if the math's wrong, but I know he's right around 40 defensive snaps, plus he's played just a, a handful of special team snaps. Uh, 24 pass rush opportunities or 28 pass rush opportunities. And I know for a fact, he has two pressures. Uh, so if you amplified his snap count, I do think his pass rush performance would be more in line. And you go back to New England game, especially the New England game. He was close on a number of opportunities. Uh, they did the loopers where he's coming inside up the a gap and, Mac Jones is fading in the pocket to get the ball out and bought himself enough time where it wasn't a hit. And Mac Jones getting the ball out in general in uh, 2.3 seconds on average across 40 pass attempts or whatever it was. So it was always going to be hard to get home on those opportunities. Um, I'm not worried about Jalen. I, I see people on social and they're, they're hammering Jalen Phillips because he's not coming in and doing what Gregory Rousseau is doing right away from a production standpoint. But uh, there, the dolphins are also taking their time with him. And I know we want to see the results right away. Um, but that's just, that's never how this team has done things. And we'll see. I, I think he's going to be just fine in the big picture of things. Um, but I think Jalen Phillips throughout the course of the season, and along with a couple of these guys, is going to get weaned into bigger and bigger roles. Uh, the next reason why I think that week two 
is going to be better for the Dol or week three is going to be better for the Dolphins than week two was. Have you guys seen the Raiders' ability to run the football through two games? And, and I understand they played the Ravens and they played the Steelers, two really good defenses, right? Pittsburgh through two games has run the ball a grand total of, where's the exact number? I had it written down in my notes here. 46 times they've run the football in two games. They have 134 yards on 46 carries in two games. 2.9 yards per carry. 2.9. On average, across 46 carries, the Las Vegas Raiders are getting 0 0.1 yards before contact. 0 0.1 yards before contact on 46 carries for the Raiders through two games. They haven't had Richie Incognito, and they lost Rodney Hudson, and they lost Gabe Jackson in the offseason, and their starting right guard is, is out of the picture. Denzel Good is out of the picture now, too. He was hurt in the season opener. So Miami, they got gouged in the opening possession against the Raiders, or against the Patriots. Uh, gave up the 30-yard run. Uh, Buffalo Bills opening possession, get gouged for the 40-yard touchdown by Devin Singletary or, or whatever it was. This is not a team who, and Josh Jacobs missed week two as well with a toe issue, so he may not even play. So you've got Kenyon Drake, you've got Peyton Barber, you've got uh, whoever's at fullback for, for them, uh, Alec Ingold. So there, there's going to be uh, a really good opportunity for the Dolphins to play into the strengths of their own defense, which just happens to mesh with the strengths of the Raiders, which is good on good passing game, uh, passing defense between those two things. So as I look at this matchup for Miami, man, there's a fly in here. Did I get him? I just took an L on the live stream, but I'm sorry you all had to see that. No animals were harmed in the recording of this podcast, but he had to get the hell out of here. Anyway, as I look at this matchup, I think Miami can match with physicality on, a, on the outside with what the Raiders have in the passing game, and then it just really becomes, can you do what you could not do the first time around when these two teams played ahead of, uh, right after Christmas last year, which is contain Darren Waller. Right. Derek Carr is, is in front of the NFL in passing yards. He's got 817 passing yards through two games. Um, generally, just throwing bombs down the field, whether it's Ruggs or Waller. I like Miami's ability to match personnel there in a lot of instances. Now, Waller's a little bit of a different animal. Uh, he's very unique as an athlete, very dynamic. He's open even when he's covered. We'll see how Miami tackles that individual proposition. But um, I think what the Raiders do well matches what the Dolphins have done well for the vast majority of the season. So uh, defensively, the Raiders, I mean, they've put up uh, 33 and 26 points. They're averaging 29 points per game. I would be willing to bet they are under 24 in this football game. And then the question just becomes, do you think uh, the Dolphins can score, score a couple of touchdowns and put up more than 24 points against the Raiders' defense? And uh, Baltimore got them for 406. Uh, Pittsburgh passed for almost 300 yards and did not run the ball. Pittsburgh, um, I'll, save, I'll save my next talking point here. After I tell you guys about our friends, at DirecTV, I want to tell you about a simple way to get all the entertainment that you love without the hassle. DirecTV Stream brings your live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before, which means you can watch your favorite sports movies and shows all in one place. And the best part, there's no annual contract, so stop waiting to get your TV together and use DirecTV Stream. You can learn more at DirecTV.com. That's DirecTV.com. Built Bar is a protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. I upstairs, I just got the box of the uh, chocolate or, or the cookie dough 
flavor that they've sent out as a sampler. And oh my goodness, it is to die for, literally to die for. Built Bar, high in protein, high in fiber, low in calories, low in sugar, 100% chocolate on all their bars. They have this delicious new uh, cookie dough flavor and nine others to choose from. So whether you're looking for something that's keto friendly, grab and go, midnight snack, meal replacement, dessert, post meal, uh, eat your sorrows away, which I may or may not have done on Sunday, uh, Built Bar can be it. So visit BuiltBar.com, use promo code LOCK15, and you can save 15% off your next order. That's BuiltBar.com, promo code LOCK15 to save 15% off your next order at BuiltBar.com. Ryan, you're getting way too many damn sponsors. No such thing as too many sponsors. If anybody would like to sponsor the podcast, I will be more than happy to tell the world how great you and your brand is as well. Um, my last thought. And somebody had had the comment about, uh, you know, the Dolphins don't run the football in the comment section here. I think Miami needs to have a bit of a gut check offensively. I think we got to be honest with this team. If we're the coaching staffs this week, uh, Miami's averaging, I think, 72 yards per game rushing the football. And they got out of the game big time against Buffalo, uh, New England. Obviously, the the chaos that they create up front uh, with the gap exchanges and and the really physical, heavy hitting linebackers. Yeah. Okay, I can understand why there's you know, situationally some hardship running the football. You didn't go out. Let's be honest. The Dolphins' mo and brand of football player is big, dense, physical, aggressive, powerful. You know, and, and whether or not that is applied in real time with contact and actually landing your hands on the guy you're supposed to be blocking uh, is a story for another day because it's it's not where it needs to be right now, right? But you don't you, you go out and you draft these 325 pound plus heavy hitters across the board. You need to be able to run the ball. You need to be able to reset the line of scrimmage and move some of these dudes against their will. And damn it, if I didn't see Liam Eikenberg and Solomon Kinley put uh, Christian Barmore on ice skates in week one on a double team, you're capable of doing it. So I want to put, whether it's Tua or Jacoby Brissett, can we put the RPO block the the run blocking and then have the past concepts where we're trying to do all these different things just for a little bit of time until the pass protection calms down a little bit. Can we come back to a little bit more traditional play action passing and straight running the ball? You need to be able to run the ball against this Raiders team. I'm sorry, but if you can't utilize some push up front with this point of emphasis that your team has had in player acquisition, I don't know what to tell you. Well, Austin Jackson, 325. Solomon Kinley's 340, and it doesn't sound like he's going to play. You know, Eichenberg's 310. Dieter's 315. Robert Hunt's 335. Jesse Davis is another big guy. But if I told you the defensive tackles, for the Raiders were Jonathan Hankins, Quinton Jefferson, Darius Phelan, and Solomon Thomas. And their two starting defensive ends were Max Crosby and Yannick Ngakwe. And both of those guys are 250 on a good day. You've got a massive size advantage. Run the freaking ball, man. Well, I mean, let, let's, let's have a gut check. Let's have that hard conversation. Let's be pissed off at the way you played on Sunday against Buffalo. You got things handed to you by a smaller, faster front. You got another opportunity in, in the Raiders to try and at least consistently be able to pick up four yards per carry running between the tackles. I want more downhill running, personally. Uh, I want these guys double teaming and climbing. I don't want them to be afraid to climb to the linebackers, which is one of the restrictions with the RPO. 
because you got to take care of the A level only. You can't climb to the second level because you get one yard in the NFL before you're an eligible receiver downfield. And we've seen in each of the last two games, Solomon Kinley got popped for it once and Austin Jackson got popped for it once. If the entire identity of this team is going to be RPOs, it's going to be really limiting. It is because they're going to sit on your primary read and they're going to give you a pass look as far as fitting the box. But you as a quarterback, you now have to make that decision very, very quickly. And there's not often a lot of baked progressions to work the field. It's okay. Are they giving us the run? No. Okay. The next step is the pass concept. But if they cloud the corner and they have the safety sitting down and he's staring at the slant running right into his area and zone, as a quarterback, what are you supposed to do? You can't throw it the slant because he's going to get his clock cleaned and you can't throw the bubble against the cloud corner because he might jump it and take it for six the other way. So let's run the ball and actually get up in the faces of these linebackers a little bit. And then you can build play action passing off of it if you'd like. It's too much RPO right now. And this is a matchup for Miami that I do feel like you can take advantage of your size advantage. You're not always going to be able to run the ball because your backs aren't overly big and powerful and the offensive line is constructed a certain kind of way. But you have such a size advantage here that you should be able to take advantage of it. That's kind of where I sit with, with Dolphins Raiders right now. We, of course, have to uh, work through the next couple of days, and we'll have crossover Thursday this week and hope to get a hold of Joe Rose and catch up with him and see what his thoughts are on the Dolphins after the disaster that was, and we probably won't talk about it. We'll, we'll shift eyes forward to Las Vegas. Um, but I would just tell Dolphins fans, let's hang in there, right? You know, it, it's still very early in the season. They have to find a balance in everything that they're doing. Um, they need to move some personnel around and they know that they've made that admission. Uh, do I agree with the, the first reported assumed, um, pathway that they're going to go after? No, not particularly, but, uh, Miami has never been a team that started fast. Uh, it's okay to play a bad game now. And again, I would love for it to not be against Buffalo. Uh, but at the end of the day, they all count the same in the win-loss column. Miami's one and one. You got 15 games ahead of you. I don't think we can be pushing the eject button on the entire season at this point or anything like that or, oh, woe is us. Uh, but things have to get better. And things have to change. Their original plan in a lot of instances I don't think is going to happen the way that they hoped it would. We'll see what Will Fuller brings to the table. Maybe he brings a different dynamic. Maybe he does introduce some of the spacing things uh, that they talked about conceptually. Uh, but I also think from Tua Tagovailoa's perspective, whatever concerns the coaching staff has with his ability to read the field um, because of the high frequency of RPOs, those questions have to go away too. Um because I think the infrastructure of this offense, they may have leaned too hard into, well, let's do what he does best. But if you only do what he does best and there's limiting factors that, that create some of these identity crises that we're, I think we're seeing with this Dolphins offense, uh, then you need to add more to the menu. And I think that's kind of where we're at offensively and schematically for the Dolphins. So there's a lot of layers here. It's not as simple as... Chris Greer sucks, fire Chris Greer, or Brian Flores sucks, fire Brian Flores, or Coach Lem sucks, so fire Lem, or cut players X, Y, and Z. There's a couple players I would like to not see on the team, if we're being honest. I think you know who some of them are. Uh, go back and listen to some of the stuff in January, and oddly enough, those players who were limiting back then have had their limitations. Those exact same limitations show up again early through two games. So... um Hopefully, Will Fuller can help push some of those players in question on the offensive side of the ball and the skill players out of those reps. Uh, offensively, not really surprised that 77 struggling. He kind of is what he is as a player. 73 is the big change for me. I uh, was hoping to see at least a marginal step forward. He's a worse player than he was last year at this point in time. So I don't know if that's Greg Little. I don't know if that's Liam Eikenberg. I don't know who that is. 
don't know if you do go out and trade for Laramie Tunsil, which I wouldn't expect them to do, but I know a lot of people want to. We'll see. Um, but yeah, this is an evaluation for us as fans, just as much as it is as an evaluation for the coaches to figure out the players and how to make it work. And uh, everybody's opinions are going to change and, and the dynamics of this team are going to change. They're not going to be fluid. They're not going to be the same team three weeks from now that they are today. So cheers. Thanks everybody who tuned in on the live stream. Make sure you hit subscribe on the channel and like this video. If you enjoy some of the live stream interaction stuff that we have, I always enjoy hearing from you guys, even in times of hardship uh, like this, where everybody's frustrated. I'm frustrated too. I think that's something we as fans uh, would benefit to remember, right? Is we all love this team. We all want to see this team be successful and turning on each other for having differing opinions. I don't think is uh, the best way for us to, to voice our frustrations. We all love this team, right? So let's stick together. Let's talk about it. Let's have some healthy conversations and let's hope the dolphins do the same and figure this thing out. Cheers. Thanks as always for listening to Locked on Dolphins. Keep it locked in right here on Locked on Dolphins, your team every day. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday night slash Wednesday, and I'll talk with you all again.